take off this headset. Good morning. Um, my, uh, for those of you who have not, uh, who, who, da, who do not know me, my name is Brian Zimmerman. I'm the CEO um, and head engineer for Grand Dial Communications here in Grand Rapids. Um, we are a full service um, voice over IP company. We do phone service nationwide uh, for customers. Uh, in addition to that, we do a lot of data management, data network management, and data center management. As part of the client endpoints uh, management for our business, we use Microtik products very heavily. Um, are you, any of you guys familiar with Microtik at all? I have a friend who uses them. He swears by them, so but I'm interested in getting new routers. So this would be nice so, to know more about this product. Okay, very good. Anyone else? First, I've heard of them. Okay. Microtech's been around for a number of years. I'm going to leverage their website here. Um, they've got some nice products scrolling here on the top bar. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to their hardware page here real quick and bring it up. So um, one of the things that Microtech is known for is they're a Linux-based router. So um, you can think of them as the Swiss Army knife of routers out there. They're going to be kind of the de facto, uh, de facto standard in all things Linux routing. Um, when you look at their product lineup, they have residential gateways, you know, the standard five, you know, five port type technology. Um, but interesting, one of the interesting things that you start looking into when you start looking at the Microtik products is you go down, as we go down this little list here on their site, we've got their hex light, we've got a hex, which is a little bit of a step up. Um, you notice the RAM jumps up on it. Um, then we've got a couple, we've got a little PoE switch here. So they've got router switches. Um, there's, I mean, there's new products showing up here every couple of months. Um, these things are designed for IT guys. They're really designed, uh, they started out in the industry as kind of a niche product for um, ISPs who were doing specialty deployments that you needed uh, Wi-Fi devices out uh, outdoors. You needed little switches, little routers that could do pretty much any kind of routing that you would need. And as we go down the list, they start going up in functionality. You get to a 10 port, uh, 10 ports on the router, um, the router OS, which is their, their Linux distribution, uh, um, they call it router OS. And as we go up the, go up here, we start getting into rack mount units, which, um, you know, start giving some of the little bit higher end solutions for the network, for the enterprise networks. Then we get up here in here into what they call their, um, cloud. Uh, solutions. These have uh, dedicated encryption chips in them for acceleration of AES-256. Um, they have a platform called the Dude Edition, which is network tracking and monitoring. So you can actually, if you use this router that has the Dude Edition in it, it actually has a server in it that allows you to track and you can put a hard drive in here and record um, uh, metrics on your networks. And we go on up here and they've got their cloud routers, which when we get up into their cloud routers, their CPU starts going up, the amount of throughput and processing starts going up as well. But you'll notice even in these enterprise high end high end routers that they've got, we're spending less than, you know, six to nine hundred dollars on the high end here with their C, uh, their their cloud Ethernet switches and routers. So we're getting very high value. Um, in the industry for what's in these boxes. So one of the things that um, Microtik is known for is their, um, their flexibility. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring up a Microtik uh, console login here. So this is the Microtik management interface. It's called Winbox and um, Winbox, you can actually manage Microtik routers from an SSH console. You could manage them from Telnet if you wanted to. Uh, they have a web interface. I leverage their Winbox because there's such a great flexibility to it. Uh, it connects over a dedicated management port. But, um, you know, for 
someone who's never used a micro tick, you can start out with a quick setup and you can go through and do, you know, kind of a residential kind of configuration on your router where you can set this particular router has wireless in it. It's got, um, you know, an internet interface, your local interface. So you can very rapidly set up your network. Um, and they've, the nice thing is, is they've got different modes that you can leverage these in. Uh, a traditional residential um, unit is gonna work primarily as a home, a home router with a wireless access point on it. You can actually do point to point bridges with these. Uh, and this is this is a this particular unit is probably the fifty nine dollar unit that we're into, but you can do point to point bridges. You can do a Wisp access point deployment, so you can change this this router into an access point if you choose to do so. It's all in software, so this is truly a software defined networking um, appliance. So you can pretty much define what you want the device to be. So you could do a traditional router. You could do it as an access point. You can do it as a um, client bridge. Uh, you could shut the wireless off on it and use just routing functionality. So there's a lot of functionality in the box. Um, one of the things that we look at here is um, they have full uh, caps interfacing. Uh, this is actually available on 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 very high end routers, but not usually on lower end routers. We get into our interface lists and we can actually go right down to every interface on the box. Um, the cool thing is, is you can actually aggregate your interfaces into, into, into interface lists. So when you start creating rules, you can actually create a list and have those interfaces um, be, uh, be aggregated and you can apply firewall rules NAT rules and things like that to lists of interfaces. One of the other cool things that you can do with this particular unit, this one actually, um, this one actually has a USB port on it, and we could actually plug in a USB LTE device. So let's say you had an old AT and T or Verizon USB cellular modem, you could put a SIM card in that, plug it in here, and then you could set it up as a as a cellular backup for your device. Now, remember, this is all in a $59 package. The base unit's a $59 package. You actually have this functionality from that base, you know, actually $40 unit if you've got a if it's got a USB port on it, all the way up to their high-end enterprise units. Some of the LTE units can also take um, you know, uh, cellular cards if you uh, some of the boards, you can open up the case, and they'll they'll actually be uh, like an M2 slot that you can put in a cellular card. So that varies from model to model. And then we get down here. Wireless has a whole wireless interface on it. Depending on the radios that are available in the unit that you purchase, um, they have all the way up to you know they've got 5G, they got 60G uh, radios. Um, You've got you've got all the statistics on your radios. You can get in here and play with every single aspect of how the radio operates. These really give you a lot of access to the underlying protocols. So you can actually fine tune this. There's pros and cons. If you if you don't really know what you're doing, you can get yourself you can mess yourself up pretty quick. But one of the other nice things here is every single interface has access to traffic statistics using our RD graphs as well. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna really quickly just hit on this. Um, the, the cool thing is is by default, most of the units build a configuration where you put all of your local traffic on a single bridge. The nice the nice thing here is, is I can create as many bridges as I want. So I could actually have three or four different bridges um i can route my traffic however i feel uh and and i have a, a great deal of detail every single one of these view uh, every single one of the microtech products also supports full vlaning so you can actually have these exist on enterprise networks you can take the enterprise network and put it a level network and put it into your small business environments your home environments 
and you're not paying um, the price of an enterprise router in, in many cases to get started with this. Okay. Um, P, uh, point to point um, networking. Um, there's a number of different uh, a number of different VPNs, PPTP, um, you can do PPP. Uh, so this allows you to connect to ISPs that require uh, PPP connections. In addition to all of this functionality, you can also do open VPN on these units. You can do IPsec on these units. Um, the performance level, the number of connections you can use is directly related to the amount of RAM and the speed of the CPU. On most of the residential units, We've had great success doing one or two open VPNs or a single IPsec, as long as you're not pushing a great deal of traffic through them. And then here's the switches. You actually have low level access to the switches that are built into these things. So we can see that the first ethernet port is set up as the gateway. And then we can actually go down and we can play and we can actually drop, um, drop ports out of the switch fabric or tell it to exclude it. So we can actually have switching on the on the ports or we can actually let the CPU route to those ports depending on how we want to configure these units. Now, the nice thing is the switch traffic is much faster than routed traffic because the switch traffic does not require CPU intervention. It's built in as part of the ASICs. So each model has different capabilities on its switches. Um, and you would actually have to look at the specifications to see what those are. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about the mesh. Um, they have a whole mesh subsystem in here. You can actually set some of these devices up to behave in a mesh environment. Um, as you start going up the chain, the hardware becomes more flexible in the meshing, but uh, there is functionality uh, built in and you can actually start taking advantage of that at the level four licensing. So there's uh, with the micro, with the router OS, you can get like level one, level two, level three, level four, and they add or unlock features at those different levels. Okay. And then where a lot of things come in here is your IP. You can see here where we can get, you know, look at our addresses here. We can add static addresses. You notice that there's a dynamic address from the ISP here on this on this WAN Ethernet one gateway port. And then we have IPs addresses, an IP address assigned to the local bridge. The local bridge would be, in this case, our internal network. Now you can create, since you can create as many bridges as you want um, within reason as far as the memory is concerned, that allows you to have multiple networks, multiple segments, you can route between them and add a bunch of different flexibility. Um, for those of you who have don't have static IPs, you can turn on a dynamic DNS service that Microtik offers. And the cool thing is, is you have an IP address or you have a dynamic DNS name associated with your router. If you have this DNS name and your IP changes, you can access your router. Um, and then you've got DHCP client modes, you have DHCP server mode, you can set up your DHCP servers. Um, and then under your DHCP servers, you can do pools. So here's the default pool for, for this particular one where you can actually set your network address ranges. You can see your addresses that are used on the network. So, um, but like I said, there's a full host of features here inside of these products. Um, and then you've got a full IPv6 stack support. You've got your firewall support. Um, firewalls are extremely flexible here inside of the Microtik platform. You can use the firewalling to um, control your flow for both um, local and uh, WAN-based traffic. You can apply rules. If you look at it inside of a particular rule, the amount, the number of options that you have available, you can actually restrict rules to your input interface or output interface. You can have an input interface list, output interface list, but, and then they have, uh, you can actually do route marks, connection marks. 
So you can actually have your traffic at, be filtered and, and firewalled based on a number of different, um, different criteria. And this is just the general. Then we kick over to the advanced and then we start adding source address lists. So we can have lists of addresses um, and groups for source and destination. You can do connection bytes, you can do packet rating, all of this in a $40 package to start. Um, you have traditional network address translation. I'm gonna switch to another unit that I've got up here real quick. Um, I think I've got one, okay. So inside of this, I'm gonna just really re quickly show under the firewall, this has a, uh, got a few more advanced configurations here. Um, so we've got a few more rules in this particular firewall, but inside of this, we start getting into some complex NAT. For this particular system, this has some phone service routing on port 3000, 3001. Now, the cool thing is, is for this, I wanna restrict who gets access to that. So I actually can do my destination NAT here. I can say that anybody coming in on the WAN list. Now the cool thing here is we have multiple connections to this. So if we, uh, if we go back to our interface in this unit and we look at our lists, the WAN is made up of the fiber bridge and an alternate uh, bridge that we've set up. So what this, this one rule allows us to say, if you're coming in on port 3000 on any of the WAN interfaces, so either the fiber or the alternate, which in this case happens to be a cable uh, internet connection, we can actually have this rule apply. But if you're coming in on any of the LAN interfaces, this rule is ignored. This rule is not applied. Now, the other nice thing here is I'm also restricting this to the management remote port forwards. So this particular source address list allows me in the firewall to actually have a list of addresses that can manage. And so as we add IPs to this address, to this list, this, this determines who can actually get into do management. And so this is a very handy for us. We can put like our office's IP address, another vendor's IP address in here, and hackers can't beat on these rules then because they're restricted right down to the IP address. But we do this using the address lists. Now, the cool thing here is inside of this, we do, um, I don't have an example of it and I can't show you that because of security reasons, but um, you can do what's called port knocking where um, we can actually add you to the management list for a period of time, if you know a series of IP ports and you hit them in a specific sequence with a specific time delay. And so we can actually, um, so let's say I was out working at a customer's, I hop on their network and I need to manage another customer's router. Uh, their, IP, that, their IP address is not gonna be part of the allowed list, but I can actually port knock it using a specific sequence of ports which uh, effectively unlocks the routers. So these are some complex advanced setups. So we go from very basic home kind of deployments all the way up to some very complex enterprise deployments. And then um, one of the last things that I wanna show you real quick, I mean, there's a whole much more here in this inside of this. You can get into you know some advanced tools, IP scanning, net watches, things like that. But one of the big advantages of this technology is we can actually mark and mangle packets. They call it the mangler. And um, it, for instance, one of the things that we wanted to do here on this is we wanted to mark all traffic for port, for this IP address, for uh, the 85136 IP address. If it was coming in on the, on the VLAN 10 data interface, we wanted to, market to use a specific outbound route. So here we're marking it to do um, the route RP1 or RP2. If we go in here into this and look at the RP2 route in the route tables, you can see I've created a number of routes. This particular route, RP2, prefers to go out the alternate network first. And then if that alternate network's not available, it will go out the fiber network. 
And so I can then write, write um, scripts and routines to detect, are these networks up or down? Are they physically there or not? Um, how far can they ping out? And so I can write scripts in the back end and then disable these precedence rule, these precedence. And with these mangle rules, I can then flow traffic. So I could have traffic from a specific IP flowing out a specific internet address or a specific internet connection. And then um, traffic from another IP or set of IPs could flow out yet another internet connection. We actually have some deployments that have five or six internet connections out there for different reasons. And we flow the traffic through to them. Um, and it gives a great deal of control and a great deal of flexibility inside of controlling your networks. Um, in addition to all of the routing, the packet mangling, you can also do uh, quality of service and full management of your routers. So um, I've covered a lot. This is just really covering their basics inside of the Microtech technology. But um, I do wanna mention in addition to the routers, which I've covered, um, they've got they have network switches that are that have combinations of wireless and unwired solutions. But then we also get into a, an extensive line of wireless devices, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and like I said, there the cool thing is, is these all run on the router OS. So once you start to learn and understand the router OS, you can actually apply the skills to configure these different devices. And they've got devices to handle a number of different tasks. You've got long haul radios, uh, point to point. Um, you've got, you know, 2.4 and 5.0 gigahertz backbone radios. And so you can see the list goes on and on and on. This company's, um, like I said, they, they are the Swiss army knife of network technology. This particular unit, I think the WAP series, there's a couple different ones. We actually put a cellular route, a cellular modem into these, and we actually hook these into, um, into networks, routers of all kinds if, on an ethernet port, and we leverage these as a cellular modem. Now, the cool thing is that you see here, if you go out and buy um, uh, most cellular routers, you're gonna pay upwards of two to $300 you can actually get an, an access point with a cellular router and a single ethernet connection starting at 130 bucks. You just slap in your, um, you just slap in your SIM card and now you've got a cellular radio environment that you can then bridge back to an ethernet port and do all kinds of stuff with. So um, I'm gonna stop there in regards to products um, and then just start taking some questions. I had a question, Brian. Um, how often do they like um, release firmware upgrades, and how long do they typically support a product? Um, I've got products that I have that I have put in five years ago, and I'm still putting new firmware on them. So it's it's really weird that they officially say three years, but I have products going back five and six years that the new firmware still supports. So you may not be able to take advantage of some of the new features on them, but this, from a security standpoint and things like that, they they haven't left me hanging. Now, as far as updates, I see updates about once every 30 to 60 days on average. If there's a security bug or issue, I mean, it's sometimes we've seen hours. As soon as a security thing's there, all of a sudden, within you know, 24 to 48 hours, there'll be a patch. And so, um, you know, as with any router, there is risks, you know, there can be security holes, bugs. They went through, a, they had some major security holes and bugs. If you left your management interfaces open on the internet, they had a few where they found that they could stack overflow them and, and, and change the admin password. Um, Cisco's gone through that, Juniper's gone through that, I mean, out. The whole industry's had those problems. So we actually, to better protect ourselves, went to, um, now they, they've patched all of those. We haven't had any issues in several years um, with any major uh, networks, network um, security issues with these guys. 
but um, unlike Netgear and a lot of the others that are out there that leave things unpatched for years, these guys are on top of it. If they know about it, they fix it. Um, and the cool thing is, is uh, using things like port knocking, you know, limiting access to management ports. Um, you can actually do tar pitting. In fact, with the port knocking system, if we set up tar pit lists so that if people try to connect to port 222 or the Winbox port or web ports, we actually can list it. And if somebody pings that port, we can throw them in a tar pit list, which restricts them from accessing the routers. So there's a lot of tricks and things like that that you can do. Um, but you do have to be aware of out of the box, these, you know, they, they restrict stuff. But if you're not careful, you can open yourself up to potential risk because there there are so many options and they leave it on you to un learn and understand what you're what you're doing. Any other Great. questions? Um, are they typically available only through their website or like a local reseller or the Amazon or? Yes, all of the above. Uh, they're a commodity based product. Uh, we sell them heavily. Uh, we're making you know two to five dollars on a on a device when we sell them. You know they're not a high margin product. We actually make our money on services and that. But um, you know, like I said, some a few of their higher end products they do kind of restrict to resell specifically. <laughs> but um, for the most part, you can find them out there in the you know out there in the industry. And like I said, I try to stock the most common things that I use. But um, but like I said, I mean, the one thing that these are so popular, it's not unusual to have all the distributors in the country go out of stock on something for four to five weeks, you know, because somebody will get a run on a particular product. Like when the pandemic happened, a bunch of people went out of stock very quick because guys like me all of a sudden realized, hey, you know, we've got to stock up on these because we have to deploy all of these customers running home and they need VPNs and other stuff. And these are our go-to Swiss Army knife. So it's one of those things where you have to watch uh, in the industry. But um, but yeah, you can get them on Amazon. Um, you know, there's a, there's a host of other places out there. Um, awesome. but, Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Was this of was this of interest to you guys? Was it helpful? Um, did I give too much information? Um, I yeah, I think it was good. Okay. You you mentioned about the SIM card, and that's something that really interested me. Uh, I'm just curious, have you used that? Is it pretty easy to implement? And does it require, you know, advanced pricing? I've got 110 of them out there right now. We actually use them for failover for all of our customer networks. And um, basically, like the hundred, you know, they, they've got several different models. Um, some of the different models actually have the SIM cards in them. But basically, you just buy the unit and you have to make sure that it supports a SIM card or has a radio in it. There's some of the units that they sell that don't have the radio but has a slot. And then you can buy a radio for $50 to $70 and put into the into those units. So it varies from unit to unit. Like, and like I said, when you, when you start looking at uh, some of these, like, these, some of these WAPs, when you look at them, you have to look at them, and some of them say um, LTE. Let me share my screen again real quick. So when you look at some of these um, here, if I search, so like here, the WAPR has LTE. So this particular unit actually has the cellular modem built in. And if we look here, you know, it's got the router OS, the license level is four. And you can actually see the specifications on, you know, how many, this actually has a wireless access point in it. It's got an ethernet port. Um, so one ethernet port and one SIM. There's a few of the models that have two SIM slots. So you can actually have a primary and a secondary cellular carrier. And they've got two modems. Obviously that's priced a little higher to accommodate the additional modem. But um, the cool thing here is like for this particular unit, I use a lot of these. I can actually bridge the cellular radio directly through to the ethernet line. So when I plug it into the other router, it basically hands off the IP address from the cellular carry, carrier directly to the, um, the other router. So um, like I said, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, in addition, one thing I will say, 
Microtik started out, they didn't sell these pre-packaged products initially. Initially, like here, you asked about modems. For those devices that don't have modems in them but have an M2 slot to take them, you can see that you can get like an L, uh, you know, uh, a $70 modem, and they have a couple different styles. So this is an international bands. This is a U.S. band modem. Uh, you can buy the WAPR without a modem in it, and then add the modem later if you wanted to. So this is the WAPR um, with for $80, but it has the slot and it doesn't come with a modem. So if you bought it this way, you could use this as an access point with a single Ethernet line to hook to any network and use just the access point functionality. But let's say you wanted to come back and throw that $75 modem in there or $70 modem in there, you could turn that into an LTE device. This could actually be an in a device where you connect wirelessly to it and then it route out the cellular. Or you could route out maybe, let's say you route out the ethernet line on your normal network and if that network went away, you could then route out the cellular as a backup. So there's a lot of flexibility here in this product lineup. Um, but as you go down the list even farther, they actually have um, they have devices to go in cars. So police, police, uh, you know, municipalities sometimes use these in, in like police cruisers and put the LTEs in them and have a full router in the car. And in that instance, $180 for a router kit with GPS and a whole bunch of other stuff in it. You know, three SIM slots, GPS tracking, LTE modems uh, for $180. You, could, you can deck out a car and track that car and have full network coverage with three different carriers. You know, you'd pop in your SIM cards and go. So... Um, and then you get farther down the list, and then they start selling you boards. So let's say you're a do-it-yourself kind of project guy. You could buy routing boards that have slots in them, and you could put SIM card, you know, depending on what it supports, you know, AC here. You can, some of these have cellular, some of them have wireless built in, uh, some of them have four ports. So these boards, this is how the company started out with these boards and products. So, cool. Any other questions? Okay. I know we went over our time. I was watching the the thing. Nobody had signed up in this room, so I appreciate your um your uh, interest and in that. If you have any questions in regards to this, I'm happy to answer them. Um, like I said we do a ton with the Microtik products. We also do a lot with Ubiquity products. Um, and well as I've worked with Cisco Juniper, um, you know, we don't use those as much for routing, uh, but like I said, we, we've, we've worked with a little bit of a ton of different manufacturers over the years. But like I said, Microtik, our three primary routing technologies we use, Microtik, um, uh, PFSense or OpenSense, which are BSD-based routers, and then the ubiquity products those are our three most popular products and then we then we diverge diversify into other products from there so um if you have any interest in hearing a talk if there's openings later i could do something on like i said ubiquity or pfsense if that's of interest to people out there as well so just let me know um maybe i am me or message me and i'm happy to have some open conversation there um, any more questions? Very good. Well, awesome, guys. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, hopefully, you'll find this valuable to you today and going on into the future. And I look forward to um, seeing you guys, some of you guys have talks as we go through the day. <laughs>